Would being able to demonstrate good management, good soil health, resilience to water stress, climate risk, pest outbreaks, and even reputational or legislative risks, would that help you to maximise the value of your agricultural property? Or in addition to your financial accounts, help you to attract investment to your business, the right type of patient capital? Or like we heard from Delene Ray of OBE today, help you to, ins to ensure um, that you can be certain that you are leaving a legacy to the next generation? And might such help you to communicate to your bank that you are lower risk and therefore can attract lower interest rates? We think robust natural capital accounts have a much greater role to play in the future of agribusiness. And if environmental accounts have a role to play beyond helping governments to manage the public good in supporting farmers to market their products, secure finance and attract investment, how can business and government work together? But to get started, I want to talk about birds, specifically the damage they cause to orchards. Some 1.9% of Australian apples are destroyed each year from birds, and at Armoured Australia estimate regent parrots damage $60 per hectare per year worth of almonds. But in both those studies, the net benefits of birds outweighed their costs. If you inadvertently scare insectivorous birds away from apple orchards, insects ruin 12.8% of apples. And by consuming the disease-ridden mummy nuts, regent parrots cut costs by up to $330 per hectare. Now, in reality, the relationships of birds to the fortunes of orchardists is a complex one, varying by season and location, but it is a good reminder that our commercial farming enterprises operate within complex ecosystems, and a failure to understand and appreciate their nuances can lead to perverse outcomes. So today I want to talk about what we mean by natural capital, why it's important to a bank, and what we are doing about it. Natural capital is our stock of living organisms, the ecosystems that support them and the services that a healthy ecosystem provide that are essential for our society. Services such as clean water, pollination, healthy soils, renewable energy and pest control. Economists have labelled these services as invisible, intangible, public and unknown, with the consequence that we struggle to invest in them or worse, treat them as liabilities when they are in fact assets. The point of using the frame natural capital is not to narrow the way in which we appreciate nature, but to amplify the imperative to measure, manage and invest in natural systems with the same due diligence and rigour we apply other forms of capital, be it financial, human or built. Now to put some context on the economic values on, of natural capital, let's go back to apples, the big apple. Apple Inc generated a profit of about US $45 billion last year. Now, Earlier last month, the World Bank estimated that improved management of wild fisheries could generate an additional 83 US billion a year. To illustrate why this value is unlocked, back in 2009, stocks of Australia's most valuable fishery, the Western Australian rock lobster, had hit a 40-year low. And through the use of a sustainable quota-based system, stocks have now rebounded and the industry is now worth some $400 million a year. If we look at other natural assets, 75% of the food we grow worth over half a trillion dollars a year is dependent upon the services of pollinators, but 40% of our invertebrate pollinators are at risk. The opportunity cost of foregone ecosystem services globally resulting from soil degradation has been estimated to be up to 10 trillion US per annum. Now, if they're a quarter correct, that's a scary figure. And if you recall Peter's soil degradation data, the trend for an agribusiness bank is concerning. And then back to the micro scale. Microbats, they are everywhere and they're voracious predators of insects. In the US, scientists have found that when just microbats are excluded from cornfields, yields drop by US $10 per hectare per year. Scale that up a across a global economy and the services of microbats create an economic asset worth billions. Yet as illustration of the consequence of ecosystem services being invisible, they are not on an asset register, nor do we have a plan to protect, invest and enhance the stock. Another way to think about the value of healthy ecosystems is in terms of risk or resilience. Across 11 years of World Economic Forum surveys of the top 10 risks to the global economy, factors linked to ecosystem service degradation such as biodiversity loss, water supply crisis, extreme weather and a failure of climate change adaptation have all routinely featured in the top 10 in terms of risk and likelihood of impact. And not surprisingly, addressing natural capital risks is critical to achieving many of the sustainable development goals. 
Now, from a banking perspective, these values raise the question, if good management of natural capital, increased soil carbon, steady pH levels, pasture diversity, nutrient recycling and habitat for pollinators and pest predators can lower the risk of commercial agribusiness enterprise, shouldn't we be valuing it? Or alternatively, do we have to wait until we've depleted our natural systems before we realise just how valuable they are? At NAB, we don't think we can. As signatory to the Natural Capital Declaration, NAB has made a voluntary commitment to investigate how important healthy ecosystems are to its business, to embed this understanding in the way it does business, and then to account and report over time. For a major financial institution, understanding the value of natural capital is best through, viewed through the lens of over 10 million customers. Whilst NAB's commitment is across its entire business, we've started with our agribusiness portfolio. Now, we've surveyed over 5,000 of our agribusiness customers twice now, and to them, natural capital risks are not esoteric. They represent strategic commercial interests. About 85% of them rated soil health, water scarcity and energy costs as key business risks. 70% said protection of biodiversity and native vegetation was a key business priority. And for those not convinced landholders in Australia understand the value of healthy ecosystems, a 2015 study of over 9,000 agricultural property transactions in central Victoria found that for properties over 1,000 hectares in size, those with 20% tree coverage attracted a 4% premium over those with none. Now, whether landholders value the amenity or the benefits of shade and shelter for stock is unclear from that study. But despite the clear tangible economic value, the last agricultural quantity surveyor I spoke to told me that the standard practice is to exclude non-productive treed areas from their assessments. And this final point highlights the central challenge. How do we make the invisible visible? How do we embed and enable and support our business decisions that account for natural capital? Our natural value strategy is the vehicle through which we're addressing natural capital risks and opportunities. It has five key focus areas, and it's not just about science. Um, the first area is, is really learning from and showcasing best practice across our customer base. And for NAB, it does start with the customer. We know our customers are ahead of us, and there's much we can learn from the pioneers. And we've been actively pr proactively showcasing leading enterprises who have implemented environmental innovations that not only mitigate environmental impacts, but also improve their financial performance and resilience. Um, interestingly, one of the channels we've been using to profile leading Australian agribusiness has been the Guardian Hub website. And what we've found staggering is that stories about sustainable farmers in Australia, um, such as Mira Dairy, who are speaking tomorrow, and a strawberry farmer from Monbolk, um, have been some of our most popular, have been some of the most popular sustainability content on the Guardian Sustainability Hub website globally. People want to read about sustainable farming practices. The second area is training our bankers so that they understand the opportunities and risks and that natural capital investments can be better integrated into existing business processes. Last year, we took 22 agribusiness managers from across the country to Tasmania to tour sustainable farming. We heard from leading businesses and scientists about the plight of pollinators, climate risks, the importance of a strong environmental brand to brand Tasmania, and how new technology is helping to solve farm problems for farmers. But the farmer challenges around natural capital resonated strongly. A generational family farmer asked how they could ensure they left a legacy to the next generation. A fast-growing horticultural enterprise whose expansion involves leasing land is looking to convince landowners that they are better tenants so they get better terms. But to do so, they need a framework to communicate about things like soil health and shelter belts and that these investments in natural capital deliver returns beyond the lease period adds an extra layer of complication. Another was managing land on behalf of European investors and his challenge was to communicate to them that he is managing the land both profitably and sustainably. The next area is, uh, is the development of products and services to make it easier for customers to address natural capital risks. Now, through partnering with the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, for the last 18 months, we've been able to offer all business clients a 0.7% discount for renewable energy and energy efficient assets. We've now loaned over $115 million, 88% of which has gone to rural based clients. Tractors, headers, bioenergy, lighting, pumps, sprayers, refrigeration, solar PV and irrigation, all improving the productivity and sustainability of farms. The fourth area is research and engagement. 
Now, in order to address other natural capital customer challenges, we need more research into the links between natural capital management and financial performance and resilience over time. This is a long-term journey, but we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We're looking to work with industry and leverage existing knowledge. To date, we've partnered with researchers such as CSIRO, SenseT, ANU, industry groups such as Dairy Australia and the Australian Wine and Research Institute. One of the key challenges we've identified is that too often environmental metrics have been collected in isolation to the economic data. And if we are to understand the impacts of environmental management and motivate action by landholders, we need to understand the economics at the farm scale. Peter mentioned the need to understand how economic activity impacts on nature, and that is critical, but we need to understand how natural capital supports economic activity. Our project with the Australian Wine Research Institute aims to do just that, to connect the environmental and financial data so we, are better, we, so we can better understand the business case for innovation. Now, Entwine is the environmental management tool adopted by 30% by volume of the industry. It provides regional, climatic and national benchmark data for energy, water, fuel and nutrient consumption. The data itself is useful. We can look at the innovators to better understand the impacts of different interventions on their farms. However, if we really want to understand the applicability of those interventions, understanding the economics is key. Now, that research is ongoing and results will be available later this year. We've asked CSIRO to target natural capital in, the, in southern cropping and northern rangeland grazing systems. The first question for CSIRO was, are there credible links between natural capital and financial performance? Um, and here's some data on the cropping. And the, the cropping space is difficult. Where, where we're more ad advanced is in the northern grazing systems. And the grazing work has focused on land condition, the ABCD framework, which, it, which connects to soil, pasture and woodland condition. Now here you can see a modelling exercise based on real data undertaken by CSIRO showing the transition of over time of A conditioned land to three possible states, maintaining A or degrading to B or C through overgrazing over time. Now here are the economics and what they've essentially shown that there's so much inherent noise in a grazing system that if you are looking at their financials in the short term, the systems are indistinguishable. In fact, you might inadvertently lend more money to a system that is slowly being overstocked. However, over time, the risks of degrading natural capital through overgrazing are stark, and the cost to return degraded land to good condition are substantial. What this means is that if you want to manage financial risk in these systems, financial accounts are not sufficient. The second question for CSIRO is how might a landholder communicate to the bank that because they are managing their natural capital well, they are lower risk? And again, it's in the grazing sector that the thinking is more advanced. Land condition can be modelled um, using time series data of, of, um, of remote sensing information. And you can see here a basic comparison of two properties um, with the amount of ABC um, D framework and they can model how that's tracking over time, um, which this attempts to do. It's a very busy slide. Um, I'm not going to dwell there. Um, so what's clear from this work is that um, the development of agribus digital agribusiness tools is fundamental to, to delivering our natural value strategy and we are rapidly forming partnerships in this space. Again, we're not seeking to reinvent the wheel, rather to ensure that natural capital metrics are embedded in new tools as they develop. And today's announcement about the $160 million food agility CRC, of which NAB is a founding partner, creates a tremendous opportunity to accelerate the adoption of technology that will help farmers to address key business challenges. The fifth area of our work and final area is that our stated intent is that within two to three years we will elevate natural capital management to our credit risk assessments. For clients, this means two things. One, we hope to be in a better position to lend against the assets that underpin the resilience and productivity of our clients' businesses. And secondarily, we will start to reward those who can demonstrate that because they've invested in their natural capital, they are lower risk. Now, pricing risk might sound dull, but it's critical because it creates explicit value in the investments that mitigate risk. If you take money from your overdraft account and spend it on something that is not valued as an asset, from your lender's perspective, you look poorer. Hence, it's vital we value natural assets such as soil health, water efficiency or biodiverse vegetation. 
Beyond our interest, we think the information has value to farmers to demonstrate to investors that their land asset is well managed, that last year's profits were not a result of land degradation, or that land condition has improved and the future returns are therefore less exposed to risk. Indeed, one agri fund manager has put it plainly, the inability of his sector to demonstrate sustainability is the major barrier to further investment. To that end, we encourage all those thinking about collecting environmental data to ensure they layer in the on-farm economic elements so that their data might underpin investment decisions in Australian agriculture. Finally, we know that Australian agriculture is rapidly transforming to become more efficient and sustainable, but we are increasingly needing to be able to prove it to underpin our reputation, and the benefits of such is the focus of the next presentation. Thank you.